that's the thing that shocks most people. You know, they think of a video game as a few people in their garage, and you say, no, this is 50, 60 people for three and a half years. Like, what? A lot of people, I think, think that video games are, you know, purely kids, so it's like a toy. So, you know, why would you put that much effort into something that's a toy? I was the kid, I was writing games when I was, you know, 12, whatever, and uh, the other kids in the block would say, you know, I'm going to play quarterback for the Cowboys, and I'd be like, I'm going to make video games, and everyone's going to play them. Like, you dork, go back to the chess club. Who's laughing now? <laughs> yes, I was in the chess club. So The Elder Scrolls is our role-playing series that we've been doing since 1994, and with each game we have started over and tried to do something very, very new. Each of them we try to, for that generation of hardware and game-playing folks, create what we think is the quintessential role-playing game, and this time we went crazy and looked at doing the game for next generation consoles and PCs that didn't even exist when we started this project. All right, so this is her new upstairs. This is her puppy named Dog. <laughs> <laughs> she talks to him and she says, no, she's got to practice. She's got things to do. She's got to practice. He has to be good dog. So she's going to go pick up that bow that's over on the table there. And she's going to take a few shots. Right now, her marksman skill is very low. So she goes and she gets a marksmanship potion. <laughs> are they drinking, water. actually drinking potions? How did you do that? Yeah, she's actually she drinks the potion. Pause it. Pause it. Pause it. So these are, this is all, wow, this is new to me. So I'm so making lists. Red. Mm -hmm. I've got that on the list as we need the potion or drinking potion. Yeah. That. Yeah. It's on there. Okay. All right. So she drinks that, which increases her marksmanship skill. <laughs> now she's tagging. Dude, that is brilliant. Well, that's great. <laughs> so she goes and picks up this book over here and starts reading. Dog starts eating. His animations are going to be tweaked. And now he's got all sorts of energy. He's running around, he's running around like an idiot. And she's starting to get annoyed because she's trying to read. She's like, she's like, no, mommy's reading. And he goes, her? Bam! Oh. Paralyzed. And falls over. <laughs> she goes back to reading while the dog twitches helplessly on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now she says she's going to go get some sleep. The dog still wants food, though. So he follows her over to the bed. She says, you're a very bad going, puppy. Thunder? You're a very bad puppy. <laughs> and he goes, <laughs> After kicking the bottle out of him. Awesome. <laughs> and scene. I think the demo showed a lot of promise, and we just have to go through and polish a lot of small stuff. And You know, the, the final battle part definitely isn't quite there yet, but, I mean, the game systems work. We just need to go back and add that extra fine-tuning, extra scripting that's required for that. So... Yeah, yeah. no panic yet. You guys are waiting for this panic, and I don't, I don't think it's quite going to come. What's at stake here? Um, there are two big focuses for E3. So one is the demo, and we'll go in there, have a big, giant plasma screen, and it'll be, you know, me and Todd in there just talking to people about the game and kind of running through the same demo every hour on the hour. And then the second thing would be the trailer. It has to be awesome. It can't miss. It's the most important thing we do, because it gets seen by everybody. For 65 years, I have ruled this empire. Generals and kings have knelt at my command. But a darkness comes. The blood tide rises. These are the closing days of the Third Era. Oblivion is a sword and sorcery epic role-playing game. You know, the things you see in Lord of the Rings or stuff like that. And at its heart, you know, it is this run through dungeons and kill things game. You have all these features and it's all kind of, there's so many things people get attached to, but at its heart, it's run through dungeons and kill creatures and take their stuff and buy bigger weapons and kill bigger creatures. And that's kind of layered in on top of this. Wow, look at these flowers. Can I pick that, you know? It's almost like two things sitting on top of each other. Here's the game, and then here's the, here's the virtual world.
Yeah, so like the trip wire is perfect for like you want to give the player a chance to avoid it. Yeah. To feel like they see it or to use it against the creatures. Again, we'll be liberal with those traps. I, I'd rather add too many and have people complain yeah, and take and them out um, rather that's than cool. have that's what I'm spaces. thinking right now with loot and creatures. Just get out. Just, yeah. Just, yeah. I'm trying to overwhelm <laughs> it with lots of loot. So that you get more out of the dungeon because you know everybody's been saying the argument you get more in someone's basement than you do in a you know, yeah. in a quest. Well, I'm uh, one of the world artists, but I specialize in the oblivion plane art and uh, the lower class, the stuff that's really dirty and dingy and sort of nasty, or the stuff that looks very deadly and scary and you know somewhat demonic or evil. That seems to be in my comfort zone. Uh, in a way that I can go do that stuff far easier than if they asked me to do anything that was nice and beautiful. This is basically showing an overview of what you'd expect a dungeon level to look like. So they're built on a grid system so that they have an exact fit and match and you won't see any seams. You know, it's, it's a lot like a Lego set in the way, except, you know, far more complex and detailed. And then before you know it, you have this world that you created in your own mind that you can sort of experience and, and feel the atmosphere and sort of the dread and, and, and the scariness of it. And this is where you find your first area that's inhabited by traps. Uh, so my goal is, you know, I'm hoping the player will walk over to the treasure chest and walk through all three of these zones, therefore setting off all three of these traps up here, 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 and here. I mean, I live, I live a pretty normal life. I have a wife and, and two uh, daughters, so it's, it's very normal uh, for me. But they, they exist in that world with me, like they're exposed to the monsters and to the films and all the stuff that I have in the house. I love the undead. <laughs> I try to use them as much as possible. Just bring in one of these guys, pop them down. And so like this one only has one arm. Or the other one has no head. I guess I'm sort of a, a non conventional sort of person so that I've always uh, stayed away from the you know more conservative side of life so I like the stuff that is far more I guess uh, less mainstream so it wouldn't just follow this route along the path here but maybe it would take this route you know and give it a little bit more lifelike behavior as far as uh, the direction it's going to travel but also uh, give people questions as to why it's there and what it stands for because that could more, be more interesting in what you read into it rather than the literal, you know, what your mind imagines. Sometimes it's far cooler than what the reality is of, of situations. I know the designers have a long wish list of art that they wanted, but you know what? I mean, if you don't get that unique looking sword, I think we can live with it looking like every other sword in the game. So. I'm waiting for Craig to do as usual. Everybody stop coding, I'm gonna fix this. Just <laughs> two step. One step forward, two steps back. So I'm gonna make everybody turn around and we'll start making some progress. I think the big thing is um, the AI we have in the game. We designed this system, Radiant AI, that allows the people in the world to react really intelligently and they sort of have their own goals so they can look at their environment around them and decide how they want to accomplish them. Our NPCs exist no matter if you're there or not. They're doing what they're supposed to do. You can send a guy off to a dungeon to kill stuff and you don't have to go with him. You go back to that dungeon, either he'll be dead or the things that he was supposed to kill will be dead. I mean, it will have happened whether you were there or not. Like this guy, I can basically go up to him and say hi to him and he'll greet me. He'll chat with me. His aggression is like a five. I'm gonna give him a higher aggression. So now he really hates my guts. He tremendously hates my guts. So we're gonna move over here and he's immediately gonna go combat with me. The guy behind him is a guard. So I'm, he committed a crime by attacking me. So the guard will attack him. These other guys are just trying to stay away. So eventually he figures out the guard is a much dangerous target than I am because I haven't struck him once. So he'll fight the guard. But the good guard saved me, kept me from getting killed. <laughs> One of the initial things we had was we turned it on so the guys could all do their stuff, and some guy went around town, some NPC you couldn't even see, went around town and bought all the armor. So when you went to the stores, there was nothing for you to buy. It's like, it's like a ship that's bringing all these water leaks, and we're constantly, like, you know, filling them up. 
Okay. Did you realize the player can easily steal a horse, ride it to this guy's place, leave it in his house, and steal all his money when the other guy goes out and tries to ride the horse, and hilarity ensues. When you have something that's powerful, it has a great capacity to be really cool or a great capacity to really make insanity. They're my actors, they're my children, they have to behave properly. When they're not acting right, everyone comes looking to me. So yeah, I talk to them and <laughs> I have them set up and know what they do. And yeah, it's kind of odd. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the lead artist for Oblivion. Um, I'm a 3D modeler and texture artist for Bethesda Softworks. I work mostly on environmental and city art. Yeah, I mean, I get a chance to really look at every aspect of the game artistically, um, but primarily I focus on the environments. Well, it originally starts out as me just thinking about things while I'm working. Um, but later on, after I have, you know, some good source images, you know, I'll do a pencil sketch like this uh, that's more defined and something that I can model from. Yeah, I think it's really hard to uh, come up with an interesting idea for something that's evil. Um, it's a lot harder than you think. Um, a lot of times I think it looks really cool, but it's not necessarily scary. Actually, this is kind of the most fun part of the game sometimes, because you're still making up ideas. It might not get in the game, but it's, I don't know, you just get to make up crazy stuff, and it's, it's cool. So. So we are in Shaden Hall. Uh, this is the overhead view in the Elder Scrolls construction set, which we used to build the game. This is where we put in all the houses, the trees, you know, paint all the landscape textures on, everything like that. Okay, and then these are our little door markers over here. This indicates that this is a door you can go through. There are a few things that might not look like doors, but they are. Yeah, this well behind the abandoned house might be used for nefarious practices, or it could be a secret door. It's really fun, because, you know, we go everywhere to find source photographs. Like, we took a day trip to D.C. one weekend, and we just took tons of pictures of buildings, trying to get the, uh, just the right, you know, stone pattern, and making sure that we photographed everything we possibly can, just in case. Well, I took, uh, the, the photos I took here, I ended up using for a lot of the Imperial City base stonework. Yeah, so it ends up, you know, looking somewhat boring to you, but, you know, we can uh, take the edges of these stones here on the ground or all the little stains in there and use those and build a whole new wall in the game. I can't get over how much this looks like something in the game. It looks really nice. Even, like, just the top part of it up there. Uh, actually, a hard thing to find uh, generally, it's just finding nice patterns, um, just, you know, architectural details, uh, just things that we can put into a building to give it some more decoration. A really good example is you can see the coffered ceiling, um, and I tried to build something just like that in the temple in the Imperial City. So I tried to recreate something, you know, very similar to that. It's actually the top of a dome, but uh, I'm using it for the, the top of an altar instead. So once I add all these different layers into it, it's more like the final texture. You know, we've been able to make this living, breathing city that's like actually there. It's like, man, I totally live here. <laughs> Did you actually select the right idle animation in the idle manager? Yes. <coughs> Click on the camera. Right. We have over 100 bugs and tasks open in the database. And that number fluctuates anywhere from 50, and we've had over 300. Candle fact, 01. So essentially, you didn't go ask anybody who made this up? No, 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 it doesn't work. I asked Don, and she told me to do this. She's still bluffing. Uh, it all ties together. It's all one big bundle of this is the universe, and you touch something here, and it moves something over there. <laughs> now you have duration one. I have duration one. In put a duration theory, zero. Well, I used zero before, but we—that's the. Well, only that would get rid of the problem you think you're having. And he did not. <laughs> See, I mock you. What's his energy? Oh, that's high. Set it to five. Low energy idle more. Oh. No, he didn't do he it. He just anyway. finished it. 
that could well be a bug. If you run through the demo now and see the lightning effect, the fireball effect in the bookstore is messed up. But if you don't see the lightning effect, it's fine. So basically, for this next week or two, you know, you guys are really gonna have to talk to each other. You're gonna have to be really, really smart about stuff that you put in the game, stuff that you update. If you see anything broken, you have to speak up. Do not assume that QA is gonna catch it, that I'm gonna catch it, or someone else is gonna catch it. If it says E3, it needs to be done that day. And if you look at it and it can't be done that day, talk to somebody about it. Because um, we need to sort of slot these things and make sure it's all done over the next week. We've seen it, it's there. We just sort of have to, you know, get some of the mess out of the way and let it shine through. But we've done it before, we can do it again. So, let's do it. I'm the, uh, basically the chief deficiency inspector. So if there's any problems, you know, I'm the one in there finding them. Uh, primarily, I'm looking for crashes. Um, anything at this point specifically that's going to uh, make the demo look incomplete. Like, the worst thing that could possibly happen is for it to crash while we're showing it to people. Oh, there it is. You see that? I see that. Chris. It's that power attack thing where you get stuck. Can I kill every creature in the game? Can I soul trap every creature in the game? Can I click every button in the game? Can I exit the game from everywhere in the game? If I save the game this way, does anything get messed up? If I go here and save, does anything get messed up? I think we should throw a fireball here, but that's up to you. Yeah. I think no. It was, no? Now you've ruined everything. But it looks so cool going down there. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, uh, the beauty of my job is I get to, to do everything uh, hundreds of times. Minimum two times an hour, 10, 12 hours a day, 30 a day all week. Hey, that's like 150 times this week. My name's Christiana Meister. I'm the lead character animator. I basically take care of all of the characters, creatures, and that sort of thing. My particular favorite is the horse, you know. You, you study the skeleton and you know exactly how it should move. You go to biped and then you just drag a box and create one. Okay, so that doesn't look anything like a horse. You have to then create the structure by scaling the bones, rotating them. You, I mean, it looks really crazy right now, but you, you start off with your, your base skin and try to match up your skeleton with that. Now you can see here what I've done is put movement throughout the entire leg, but that doesn't react with the rest of the body. So then what you need to do is make sure that the rest of the body reacts to that movement because it does in real life. If you move her head, you see the hind end actually moves. Everything's connected. It, you know, there's not one joint that you can just move independently, really. And here's a horse that I can get up and ride. I have to get with the character uh, animator on this riding animation, it looks uncomfortable to me. <laughs> There's always work to be done. Yeah, I'm always, at, you know, watching her move. And, and it also helps to, uh, when I ride, I can feel what's going on. So feeling is a, is a good part of, of animating as well. Because you, you think about your body position and everything else while you're riding. I, I don't know. I, people are not my forte, really. Um, I like thinking about the four legs instead of two legs. I know there are people that are completely the opposite, but I don't know. I just I find them much more interesting. <laughs> yeah, it, it's fun. With Oblivion, we were really fortunate to get some voice talent that people know to join us for the project, including Patrick Stewart, Linda Carter, Sean Bean, Terrence Stamp. I'm always anxious about getting her late. God, I miss this. So I tried to get on an earlier flight. We got to the airport early, but they wouldn't let me on it. So, huh? 
Superman uh, one, 1 and 2, kind of my formative years, you know, when I was 6 or 7. Uh, Terrence Stamp is General Zod, and he has a great line in Superman 2 where he gets Superman to kneel and, son of Jor-El, kneel before Zod. And my brother would always do that, but change Zod to Todd. It's so just over the years, one of those things, you know, for 20 some years, just keeps going, and now I'm gonna meet him, and if I can get him to record it, send it to my brother, that'd be, that'd be great. As for the rest, the weak shall be winnowed, the timid shall be cast down, the mighty shall tremble at my feet and pray for pardon. Your reward, brothers and sisters, the time of cleansing draws nigh. Weakness will be purged from the world, and mortal and immortal alike purified in the refiner's fire. That gave me goosebumps. Terrence Stamp plays kind of the, you know, he's the bad guy. Somebody who comes from a different line of kings, who wants to make this world his own. So he's kind of a, a priest. Um, you know, he's not a cackling maniac. We like to have our, our bad guys be a little grayer. We want that moment where the player goes like, maybe he's right. You think I mock you? Not at all. In your coming... I hear the footsteps of fate. You'll tell me if I'm overdoing it, won't you? Um, yeah. Impossible. It's impossible <laughs> to overdo it. Yeah, it's kind of like he said while we were there. The character just came out of him. It's like a very serious, serious voice. You know, you know the guy at the other end of that is serious, you know. But if a god can die, how does his heart survive? Good. This, so we wrote this role, I, I called them and I said, uh, they're like, well, you know, who do you want for this role? And they'd give me a list. And I said, no, nah, I gotta have Tam Stamp. Oh, like, how I wonderful. Don't know if he does, I don't know if he's done a game. I said, I, I don't yeah. Know if he has, but I think he's just... No, I mean, I, was a little, I wasn't unnerved, but when I, I, got the, I got the FedEx last night with the okay. script, you know, and I looked at it and I thought, wow, I just don't know. I hope there's somebody there to tell me where to go because I just had no... I didn't know, like, the area of it. Like, I didn't know the area of performance, you know? Right. So I look forward to, you know, showing it to them and having them, you know... Oh, you know, I've never seen myself in that light. Just how well we can lip-sync and put other characters on the screen. Kneel before Todd. <laughs> You gotta put that in. Smile when you ask questions like that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Terrence. Gentlemen, wonderful. So, so this is... <laughs> this is my pal Terrence Stamp. Um, he's, he's, he's never done a video game before or any type of voiceover, and um, he was really, really excited to do it. He was really, really into it. He was literally, like, when they were, we were recording him, you know, leaping around doing the combat stuff so much that he would, they couldn't record him. He was moving away from the microphone, you know. I've heard rumors about the With Linda, she played the Nord females in Morrowind, and she came back Why for Oblivion to do the Nord females again. I played the Nord women, the Nords, and they are, I guess, a Viking-like race, and the women are fantastic warriors and uh, very self-confident. You know, her voice and who she is fits perfectly with that role. I'd stay inside the city walls if I were you. There's no telling what's going to come out of that gate. Of course, the next guy is my uh, wife and I with um, Patrick Stewart, who is equally as good. Ken had written a bunch of notes for Patrick Stewart on the character. Very, very long, referencing things Stewart had done before. I thought was embarrassingly long, actually. Um, <laughs> but I forwarded it on here, sent it to Patrick, and Patrick came in and said, I, I got the notes on the character, and I was sort of like, and he's like, never in my life doing any role have I gotten such detailed notes, and I loved it. I am really intrigued. This sounds really cool. You guys have given this a lot of thought. I can't wait to do it. You want to hear something really cool? What? You need to go over to Mark Lampert's oh, office right now. Okay. Well, Is Ken fine. still here? I don't know. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Just imagine the best it could be. It's even better than that. Yes. I think you want to come over to Mark Lampert's office right now. 
What is it? Good. <laughs> uh, where? It's in uh, Mark's room, the sound room. On my way. I was born 87 years ago. <laughs> for 65 years, I've ruled as Tamriel's emperor. But for all these years, I've never been the ruler of my own dreams. He was selling the product like, uh, you know, uh, a, a reverend standing in front of his flock, wh which is exactly the tone I wanted. I mean, Patrick Stewart. This is the unedited stuff. Generals and kings have knelt at my command. That's such a cheesy line that sounds good when he yeah. says it. But the generals and kings line? That's, that's what I said every time I heard Make Our Camera. Like, oh, it's like all the stuff that sounded so cheesy. These are the closing days of the third era. And the final hours of my life. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, like, if we could have picked, a, there isn't another actor we could have picked who I'd be happier to write dialogue for. Like, seriously, like, I, I geeked out over Star Trek for years. You know, that was, it was on while I was in college. And we literally, you know, all my friends, I would sit around, we'd watch Star Trek and drink beer and act like idiots. I don't have a picture of my wife in my wallet right now, but I've got Patrick Stewart in my wallet. So, there's no better actor as far as I'm concerned. Like, I get to say I wrote dialogue for Patrick Stewart. Yeah, I'm happy. Is that your wallet? Yeah, I got it. This is not a lie. See, my wife will not be happy, but I have a Patrick Stewart picture in my wallet. Right there. So you guys know our demo machine melted last night? And the motherboard's dead? We're never really sure. Could have been a defective motherboard. We could have just been putting too much into it. We weren't overclocking it at all. Um, so I checked out, we're sending it back to the manufacturer, Asus, and they're going to send us a new one. Um, so, so right now we have um, this, the code changing, we have the data changing, and now our hardware is changing. So the triumphant of things changing is bad. Better now than next week. Normally, uh, it'll crash to the Windows desktop, and you just start it back up and play it again. Well, this crashed in such a way that they actually had to completely power off the machine and restart it. And this happened several times throughout the day, and finally on that last one, it just didn't come back on. By the way, the end of the demo is completely different. For those of you who weren't here on Friday, we changed the ending. Um, it's way more dramatic. Yeah, feed me, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to do all the kids, Dave. I think it looks cool when I block them. <laughs> I mean, I think the end is the best part now, and before for me it was, you know, pr you know, the worst part, and now now I think it's the best part. I don't know if that's the newness of it, um, but it's got good epic fantasy demon stuff at the end, which I think the kids like. Yeah, the force stuff for us has always been the kind of rendering-wise the craziest thing that we're trying to do, and the thing that also is has the biggest visual impact of the game. People see it. Wow, you know, I've never seen that before. Usually, when building a scene like this, I start out by placing the rocks. Um, I sort of look at the lay of the land, which is generated first, and then I, you know, try and pick out spots where. You know, a rock might naturally occur. I've got this big one here. So, you know, I would just take a big rock like this and plop it down, sink it to an appropriate height. And then I, I'll go and add like little satellite rocks around it to try and create a feel that there's some natural uh, erosion going on. Came out looking for uh, source textures for some of the surfaces in the game, um, specifically terrain textures and like pictures of the ground, things like that. It's really tough to find images like that online, for those purposes anyway. With a rock, uh, a lot of the visual impact is going to boil down from the texturing, from the coloration in it, and um, and then using like shader techniques uh, to try and get that, that the shine and sheen and um, the cragginess to it, like the, how the lighting splays across it. Um, this color and texture is perfect for some of the textures that we were trying to recreate in the game. I mean, obviously the, the moss in general is mostly green, but there's lots of other little details here that really help um, make the textures more believable. You know, there's lots of other little browns in here, um, lots of little highlights in the green, and just other little random bits of, of nature. 
I've always obsessed over um, natural foliage and just greenery and games in general. I just, for some reason, I think that's really cool. It's, it's just not something that you normally see. And I, I definitely think it's a fun environment in a game to play in. When you think about all the leaves individually, they're, they're probably pretty close to the same color. But when you see them all in a scene like this, it's, there's so much contrast and um, play of light. Uh, in the foreground here is an example of some of our grass that we have in the game. So we've got some ivy in here and some tall grass. Um, further on, I think there's some uh, sort of generic uh, forest weed types of plants. They just, they really add a sense of, of movement and life. Like, it really makes the ground feel much more organic than, the, than this flat uh, textured surface might. There's kind of a, uh, a quiet solitude about it where there may be lots of cool and interesting things going on within the game, but you sort of know that it's, it's, a, it's in its own little pocket, so to speak. It's kind of isolated from, from you know, reality around you. It's really nice when they're, they are uh, cluttered with lots of interesting things that, you know, fool you for a second into thinking that you're in a real world. Well, it's Thursday now, Thursday morning, and um, E3 starts next Wednesday. However, the computers need to be shipped out, and they need to arrive there by next Monday. So we basically have until tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon, uh, before we basically have to stop work. The machines get packed up, and they get shipped off. We're on schedule. It's taken all late nights, deep into the mornings, the last two weeks, but... Um, Looks good, looks good. Okay, I'm a little under the weather, so I'm going to try to get through this, but if my voice dies, uh, bear with me. We built Oblivion from day one to be a next generation game for both the PC and the Xbox 360. We've always tried to make our worlds come alive visually, but Oblivion takes this to new levels. Our artists have painstakingly modeled over 9,000 objects. There are nine main cities in the game and dozens of smaller settlements. Over a thousand NPCs live in Oblivion, all with their own schedules and jobs. Good morning! Oblivion features over 50 hours of recorded dialogue, all lip-synced in real time. They say the streets run red with blood, and the danger will soon overtake the entire city. The voices fill half of the game's DVD. <laughs> I don't know what kind of titanium alloy packing stuff they've got, but whatever it is, I just hope it can take a push out of a plane at 30,000 feet. <laughs> he did it! Now we just need to make sure that works all day. If you do not have any red buttons, If they don't like it a lot, I'll be really disappointed. It's all about meeting expectations. It could still be like one of the best games there, but if it doesn't meet their expectations. <laughs> Time we start? Oh, right now it's 7.10 and we were supposed to be starting the Microsoft event in five minutes, but that's not going to happen. So we're just hanging out, uh, waiting to meet up with some folks and we go get something to drink and we'll watch them put our trailer up in front of thousands of people. I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. It's an awful lot of work to, to get to this point. I mean, we haven't seen it on a freaking movie screen, so we have no idea how it's going to look. I mean, we know it looks really good on a 61-inch TV, but on a movie screen. But if it looks as good as we know it can, and if it's um, and if the response is really awesome, I, I mean, I, I think it probably may be the greatest professional moment of my life. So how about this? How about a brand new, full-featured, next-generation role-playing game in the launch window? Morrowind was one of the best-selling role-playing games ever on the Xbox. The sequel to this incredible game is called Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. 
It promises to feature one of the largest open-ended worlds ever created for a video game. It also includes thousands of characters that are governed by brown, groundbreaking AI. These characters eat, sleep, and complete tasks all around the clock. And they make their own choices based on what's going on in the world around them. Welcome to the world of Oblivion. Hi, I'm Todd Howard of Bethesda Softworks, and uh, welcome to our presentation of The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. This game looks, looks unbelievable. It actually has trees, unlike Bardenfall. The whole first level of the game is a prison break, um, and through your actions, it really determines what kind of character you'll be. I mean, sometimes I worry that uh, games are going to get so realistic looking that I won't want to play in them because they're, uh, they're too real and then I might as well just be at home. Only this was a pretty good case for hyper-realism because the forest was, was gorgeous. Unbelievable. It's easily the most impressive game that we've seen at yeah, it's, it's like with the radiant AI thing. Yeah. That's always that's always one of my big issues with RPGs is the NPC characters are kind of boring. Like they're just there and you talk to them and they're kind of just like this clunky way of getting information. But it's, it's so much more entertaining to watch like somebody flame their dog. God, have you seen our booth? <laughs> it's off the hook. Fans of, of the series, they're gonna go nuts. <laughs> they're gonna love it. Morrowind changed my life. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know about that. Maybe it changed my I life. It definitely took away a lot of my hours. <laughs> We look back at what people really liked about role playing in the first place: the setting, the action, the heroism. seen it or not, but when the guy came out of that oblivion portal, that was cool. He was so cool. <laughs> I totally love the storyline as it is, and like the way it develops, it's like just so good. As you know, if it's an Elder Scrolls game, people are going to go white just because. 